you ever look at a stock and wonder, is this a good buy this stock? Should I buy it at this price or wait for it to go lower? Or do you ever own a stock and say, should I sell now? Or is it a bad time to sell? You never really know. That's why I'm gonna show you how to run a discounted cash flow model. This figures out the intrinsic value of the stock. And I'm gonna also look at other factors and information on the company, but watch the entire video because there's gonna be a lot of information throughout the video to help you understand things better. So I'm gonna do Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly is a giant drug manufacturer. And the way I run the model is I first input the market cap, which is the value of the company according to the stock market. That's 157 spot 26 billion. And then I need the market price, which is 164.45. Now I know the shares outstanding because it's the market cap divided by the stock price gives it the shares outstanding. And what we're going to do is we're going to estimate the future free cash flows of the company and then discount that number back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. And then we'll be able to compare the stock price to the uh, intrinsic stock price. And I, I just inputted the actual free cash flows and that's the cash that's left over after a company operates its business. So you want to see a company with healthy, positive, free cash flows each year. Because if they don't, that could be a sign something's wrong. Or they could just be growing their business. So last is revenue, and that's the sales of the company each year. And if you look at their financials, you can see free cash flows fairly consistent. Two and a half to three and a half billion each year. So, and it's a strong number. That's what you want. Uh, revenue is also consistent and pretty pretty good each year so that's that's a good sign but net income it looks good three out of four years it looks great in 2019 but 2017 it's negative how could you have a lose 204 million dollars but yet produce three and a half billion dollars of cash flow I'll show you how so if you go to the 10k in 2017 they had a 1.6 billion dollar impairment and restructuring loss that they passed through on the income statement but you can you notice the revenue is pretty similar each year and the cost of sales is also pretty similar so their day-to-day -day business was fine it's just that this impairment charge so this is kind of a little outside the scope of their day-to-day -day operations let me show you what this is exactly so so just to give you a little color on impairments okay so assets should be tested each year for impairment. Goodwill is an asset and accounts receivable are assets. And if you feel the value of the asset is not worth the price you paid for it, you should deduct the cost because it's a, you're carrying these assets on your balance sheet. So companies need to make sure the assets on the balance sheet are correct. The value, it states the correct amount. So that's why they have to go look at the assets each year and test them for impairment. So what Eli Lilly did was they noticed that some of the assets on their balance sheet were not worth as much as the stated prices. So what they did was they passed through a loss on the income statement of $1.7 billion. And this is from their 10K. So it looks like they mentioned severance. That must be severance packages for employees that work in these departments and pension and post retirement plans for employees in, in these departments. So they had to write down, because initially they valued these assets at a higher amount, but then over time things change. Uh, maybe the tax law changes or just you overstated the amount of the asset initially. So you're passing through a loss, but it's not actual cash loss it's more an accounting loss so it's not really affecting the, the business financially because you could prove this by looking at the cash flows because they have positive cash flows but they pass through this big loss so that's why you have to look at the, at the financials and understand what they're providing you and sometimes that could be a little confusing but this is in this case it doesn't seem like a big problem the impairment loss they passed through they were just kind of fixing some of the things they may have overstated in the past so now let's look at a capital structure of the company so we could figure out the discount rate we need to apply to the future cash flows so the interest Eli Lilly pays on its debt is 400 million dollars 
And let's see how much debt they have. We'll go to the balance sheet for that. The current debt is 1.5 billion. That's debt due within 12 months. And then they have long-term debt, debt due after 12 months. That's 13.8 billion. So they pay only 2.6% interest on the debt. But interest payments are tax deductible. So let's get their effective tax rate. We'll go back to the income statement. We'll get their income before tax, 5.3 billion. And the income tax of 628 million. So the cost of the debt after taking into account taxes is 2.3%. Let's find out the beta, that's the volatility of the stock. And the beta is 0.26, that's a really low beta. That means the, the price of stock moves about 25% of what the market moves. And that's what you want, you want a stock that, that's not too volatile. Let's get some more information, let's go back to the balance sheet, we'll get the current assets and that's that's usually cash accounts receivables and inventory. That's 13.7 billion. Let's get their current liabilities. That's current debt and accounts payable. And that's 11.8 billion. And the equity, that's total assets minus total liabilities. And last, we need the operating income or the EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. And that's 5.5 billion. They have such a low whack, it's only 2.6%. That's a blend of cost of debt, which is 2.3%, and cost of equity, 4.3%. And they have such a low beta. And they have so much debt, too, that's interesting. Um, that's not a good sign, but a low whack indicates you have good credit. It's kind of like someone with a low interest rate on their credit cards or mortgage. They have good credit, and somebody with a high interest rate has bad credit. So a low whack is a good thing. It's not so good that they have so much debt. But let's go look at the, so we estimated the future free cash flows for four years using the inputs from earlier. We did a terminal value, which is all years past year four. We discounted those cash flows back to today's dollars. We get a value of the company of $131 billion. We divide that by 956 million shares. We get an intrinsic stock price of 137. It's trading at 164, so it's trading at a 20% premium. Let's see what Simply Wall Street says they also value companies for Eli Lilly and they have 147 for the fair value I have 137 so we're pretty close it's interesting to see what other companies value at so let's look at their historical stock price to see where they've been trading at so we say intrinsic is at 137 so it looks like they were below intrinsic value for a while way below intrinsic value so they've been purchased up because when a price of stock goes up, that just means more people are purchasing the stock. And it's requiring the price to go higher. So people just obviously feel the value of the company is going to be improving in the future. And they see a lot of positive things with the company. And it seems like their financials are pretty strong. So obviously a stock price can go up or down regardless of how the company is performing financially. It's just how people perceive the business or the market as a whole. Let's look at their financial ratios and we'll get more color in the company. An okay PE, 19, and I like to see under 15, that's price of the stock over earnings per share. And anytime I look at ratios, I always compare it to other companies because you really don't know it that well until you look at other companies. Because you can't say, I have to have a company with a PE below 20 or I won't invest in them. But what if like um, they're 25 and everybody else in the industry is a, is a 50 PE, that's a great PE. But if they have a PE of 25 and everybody else in the industry is 15, it's a terrible PE. So always compare it to, to its competitors. So next is the price over sales ratio, and they have 7.0. I like to see under 2.2, that's stock price over sales per share. But in this industry, I think it's, they generally have high price of sales ratios because usually there's a lot of money that these companies need to do to invest and research and development to before a drug takes off. Next is price to book, and they have a 60 price to book. That seems really high. I just think it's because their price has been driven up so much, that's really increasing this number. But I don't believe other companies in this industry have such a high price to book, but we'll find that, that out in a minute. They have a good current ratio, 1.16. That means they have enough liquid assets to cover the short-term liabilities. And the ROE is ridiculously high, 319%. That's net income, which was $8 billion. 
in 2019. They had a massive year over equity. So they're providing a really amazing return. But but that was in 2019. If you um, if you looked at the ROE the prior year, it was still over 100%, which is pretty amazing. You really don't see that too often. So they're providing an unheard of value. So some of the drugs may, may have just taken off. And if you look in the past, it may have been a really low ROE because they were still going through all the research and development process in order for the drug to be approved. But now that it's been approved and sales are occurring, they're seeing a lot of the profits rolling in now. Really high interest coverage ratio, it's almost 14, so they, have, they can cover their interest payments about 14 times. And if you're the type of investor who focuses on these ratios to make your investment decision, make sure you're comparing it to other companies, similar companies, because you really don't know if it's a good ratio or not. So I have six companies in the same industry as Eli Lilly, and I have the average for each category. So like the PE, the average PE is 32. So that's a pretty high number for an average, but Eli Lilly is 18, so they're below average. AstraZeneca just has such a high PE, it's dragging up the average. And price to sales, Eli Lilly is definitely on the higher side. They have seven. They're the highest in price to sales. Price to book, they're by far the worst price to book, Eli Lilly. Current ratio, everybody's doing pretty good. A couple are a little below one. And then ROE, I'm not sure how, but Eli Lilly is just killing it in ROE, 319%. And debt, Eli Lilly is by far the worst in debt, which is the biggest red flag of this company. They have so much debt. Since they pay such low interest on the debt, I don't think it's too much of an issue. And in terms of market cap, Johnson & Johnson is one of the largest companies in the world. They're probably top 10. But these are just massive companies. Eli Lilly, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Pfizer. Uh, all massive companies. So let me know what you think in the comments. you think Eli Lilly is a good buy? What do you think of these ratios? What do you think of the video? Any other companies do you want me to look at? Thanks for watching.